Okay, so one specific aspect of this this idea of institutional thinking that I want to cover really briefly um, relates to the two chapters that I had you read from um, North and from Putnam. Um, they are historical institutionalists, and so they believe in this idea of institutions are rules for a game, um, but they offer a historical explanation for why the rules exist the way they do. Um, and it explains why rules are often very, very hard to change and why institutions and norms are really hard to change because they get entrenched. And so I want to talk about um, um, North's argument here really quick. Um, so according to North in the chapter that you read, institutions are the rules of the game. It's not necessarily a game theory game. It's just kind of the constraints that we face um, that shape our behavior. Um, what he argues is they reduce uncertainty by providing kind of they regularize, regularize human interactions and make it so that we understand how to behave around people um, when we run into people. So his main argument in the chapter that you read is that the institutions that exist, the rules that exist in society, the, the, the norms, um, the etiquette, everything that exists that shapes human interaction also determines the opportunities that we have in society. Um, and so organizations will emerge to take advantage of those opportunities. And as organizations evolve so that they can take advantage of these, these opportunities, they then actually start changing the institutions in their favor. Um, and so if we think back in the game theory world here, this is more of like a self-reinforcing institution, where if you have something that shapes the opportunities available in society, then it's going to um, privilege specific people in that society, and then they're going to write laws that makes it so that they gain more privilege and they can alter the existing rules in their favor. Um, we see this all the time um, in the United States um, with the Constitution. It was written by um, rich white landowners um, who then were able to shape the, the laws in their favor. Um, and then as they've, as early politicians back in the late 1700s, early 1800s were elected, they were able to continue to write laws um, in their favor. And as other groups um, lobbied to gain more access to the political system, um, it became a battle of um, kind of trying to get more rights from the entrenched interests. Um, and the entrenched interests through white supremacy and white, white capitalist class, um, it was really hard to fight against that because they had the power and they were shaping the rules. And so it led to um, centuries-long struggles for gaining additional rights through the system because of this argument right here where as, um, as organizations and people take advantage of the, the opportunities that are created by institutional arrangements, they change those arrangements so that they can stay in power and continue to gain advantage from those things. Um, a good example of this that uh, is kind of a more mathy, more practical way of looking at this is this idea of polia's urn. So polia was, uh, I think he was Hungarian, a uh, Hungarian mathematician that had a thought experiment that explains um, how, how systems of governance and how systems of anything can get entrenched in society. Um, he was specifically talking about mathematical systems, but it actually applies to social science fairly well. So if we imagine this bowl right here, it's a mixing bowl I just took from my kitchen here. It is clean. Um, and what we can do is we can imagine that we have a red Lego and a blue Lego. Um, these can represent different rules in society. Um, so we decide to drive on the left or drive on the right or something um, in society that we've decided that is a, it is a rule. So according to Polya's urn here, if we put these two Legos in the, in the pot here, in the urn, um, and we shake it around and we randomly pull out one of these Legos, it is red. So according to this thought experiment, we put the red Lego back in, but we take another red Lego and put it back in with it. Um, because we know that the institution worked. So if we think about, again, crashing into somebody in a doorway, um, we've settled on some sort of rule that says oldest person goes first. It worked, and so we're going to put the oldest person goes first back in there. So when people run into each other in the doorway again, we shuffle it and we draw randomly another red Lego because it worked and the probability of choosing the red Lego went up. And so what we do is we take another red Lego and put it in there. So now, if you look in here, we have four Legos, three are red, and one is blue. So 
you shake it around, you run into somebody in the doorway and you reach into your urn full of institutional norms and you say, what should I do today? And you pull out a blue. That was lucky. So according to the process, we put another blue Lego in. And you keep repeating this and it's red. So we'll put a red Lego in. And we do it again and we pull out the blue. They're fairly even right now. Right now it's three to four. But eventually you can imagine that if we keep doing this, it's red, we put it in, and we shake it and we take it out and it's blue. Eventually it will settle on one color. Mathematically this happens. And it's because of this idea of game theory where one will eventually overtake. So there's red, we'll put that in. And we will take out another red. I'll put that in because it worked. We're gonna keep doing that institution. We're gonna do it one more time. It's red. So if we look in here now, only four of the Legos are blue, everything else is red. And if you imagine that we just keep doing this over hundreds of years, um, one of these is going to eventually be the winner and that is the thing that you do. Um, occasionally you'll defer, you'll do some other institution, you'll do a blue, um, but the next time you run into somebody in the hallway, you're gonna go to red because it worked. And so you kind of get locked in to the institution because it works. And it's because of this dynamic here where it's essentially this positive feedback loop where the institution worked and so the probability of doing it again increases. And if the institution keeps working, then it's going to get further and further entrenched. The official term for this is something called path dependency or institutional lock-in, where um, the very fact that we have this institutional structure, we had at the beginning, we just had one red and one blue. So we had like a 50-50 chance of choosing one of them. As soon as we put the second red in there, we had a 66% chance of choosing red again. And so the existing institutional structure made it so um, the future institutional structure was more um, kind of biased towards the existing institutions there. Um, the official terminology for this is like the underlying institutional framework shapes the incentives that we work in and shapes the institutions that then determine our behavior. And so you essentially get this, this path dependency. It's really important um, what happens in the very early stages of a game because then it leads you to future outcomes. Um, if we wanted blue to win and blue to be the overarching institution, then it should have been, we should have by chance gotten a few blues at the beginning and then that would have tipped everything towards blue. If we get a whole bunch of blues later when there's already like 10,000 reds in there, it's not gonna do much to change um, how society is oriented because the institutional structures have been built up in a way that overwhelmingly favor red in that situation. Um, some good examples of this exist all over the world. Um, one popular example here is this idea of keyboards. Um, this top keyboard here is the QWERTY keyboard. It's, what's you, it's what you have on your laptop right now, unless you're a super nerd and you've changed the, the layout to this one here. This is the Dvorak keyboard. Um, it, it's cool, it has all the vowels right here, A, O, E, U, I, all with your left hand, um, all on the middle row. But I have never seen a computer out in the real world that has this keyboard. Um, and it's because this keyboard here, QWERTY, won out. Um, back in the very early days of typewriters, there were lots of different um, um, keyboard layouts. Um, and there, were, there was research done on typing speeds to see which keyboards would type the fastest. Um, there's an apocryphal story that says the QWERTY keyboard was actually um, too fast, or there were some keyboards that were too fast, and so um, managers of typing factories back in the late 1800s decided to use QWERTY so that it would jam up keys less often um, because it was slow, and so it's this this internet chain mail that's been going around forever that says, like, the QWERTY keyboard is awful, um, and it was that way because of jamming keys. That's not actually true. Um, what actually happened is, like, it was a really good layout, um, and it jammed far less than other layouts because um, vowels are in different places. If you had this Javorak keyboard on a typewriter, you're going to be hitting A, E, I, O, U fairly often, and those keys are all going to hit fairly close together, and that's probably going to cause a lot more jams. And so this, the QWERTY layout is good and efficient, and it won out. In our Polya's Earn example, this would be like the red Lego, um, where 
it worked. And so people who were getting trained on typing would move to a different company and they would request a QWERTY keyboard because they knew that it worked and so they would use it. Um, and then the people they trained would then also want the QWERTY keyboard because they learned on it. And so eventually it kind of just took over. Um, and other keyboard layouts haven't. Um, we see this all the time with all sorts of technology. Um, back in the 80s when we were doing cassette tapes, um, we had cassette tapes and we had um, Betamax tapes, except those may be for videos. Just kidding. Um, we had eight track tapes. That's what it was. I was like five in the 80s. Um, at the very end of the 80s. So um, you had cassette tapes and you had eight track tapes and cassette tapes won out. Um, not necessarily because they were better technologically, it's just because that's what society kind of settled on. Um, with VHS tapes, there was a battle between Betamax and VHS. Um, and one was made by Sony, one was made by some other company. Um, Sony lost out with their Betamax. Um, that did not become the standard. Um, instead, VHS tapes did. Um, even with like DVDs, the early DVDs were things called laser discs. Um, if you went to elementary school in the 90s, you used to watch movies on giant, giant laser discs. Um, those didn't catch on, but DVDs did. And that became the standard, not because they were necessarily better, though in that situation they probably were because they weren't like huge, um, but just because that is what society settled on and through path dependency and lock-in, that is the path we went down and that's what we have. Um, and so it's a useful way of explaining all sorts of things in society. Um, what Putnam does is he uses this argument here to talk about Italy where he argues that there was, there's a difference in the economic outcomes of northern Italy and southern Italy. Um, and as you read in the chapter, he determines that this difference in economic outcomes isn't that um, people in northern Italy are less lazy than people in southern Italy or anything like that. Um, his ultimate argument here is that up in northern Italy, there are all sorts of norms of reciprocity where people in the medieval times in Northern Italy got together with each other and they had clubs, book clubs, if they had books, they had PTAs if the school system existed, they had bowling leagues if bowling leagues existed, they did things together as a community. And so they had all sorts of social bonds with each other. And so as a result, that was their institutional structure. Everything worked well um, in that structure. And so that meant that um, that helped encourage economic growth. Um, because your neighbors that you hung out with playing medieval bowling, um, you could talk to them about different business ideas, you could um, encourage people to join your guild, you could do all sorts of things and have like this, this strong community that helped encourage economic outcomes. In southern Italy, in contrast, what Putnam shows in his chapter here is that the difference isn't necessarily in economic, like there was a difference in economic output, northern Italy did better, but it wasn't because like Southern Italians were lazy. What, Nor what Putnam argues is that the institutional structures were shaped differently. In Southern Italy, everybody was linked to the Catholic Church. And so all social events went through your local Catholic Church. All dispute mediation went through the Catholic Church. All job opportunities went through the Catholic Church. And so as a result, everybody was linked vertically to kind of the parish and to the main church leaders and not horizontally like they were up in northern Italy. And so those institutional structures, as a result, shaped the opportunities that were available for economic growth and economic development. And as a result, you end up with wildly different outcomes, um, but it's because of the rules and regulations and the laws and the institutions and the norms. Um, and so these things... Um, cause path dependency. Northern Italy for hundreds of years has done a lot better than Southern Italy. And what um, North Ar or Putnam argues here is that it's because of the underlying institutions that have existed for hundreds of years. And we have path dependency that's causing this, this divergence here. Um, and so it, it's, a, it's an interesting argument. It's helpful for, again, um, management perspectives. If you try to go into a new um, a new job and you decide to change the entire culture and throw it away and bring in your own, it's backed by evidence, you've learned it in your different strategy classes, it's not going to work because the previous um, corporate culture or departmental culture exists um, and it has all sorts of path dependency. It exists because things have been working in the past. So you might be working with a pot full of red Legos 
and you want to throw in your yellow Lego and make things better, good luck doing that. You're going to have to do something to discourage the use of red Legos, to encourage the use of yellow Legos, and somehow break that path dependency or somehow evolve it into the yellow Lego situation. Um, if you just try to throw in your yellow Lego, they'll do it once, and then they'll go right back to red because that's what's been working. Um, and that's hard to change. So it's something to think about as you um, work with um, different departments in the future. Um, it's really hard to change institutional culture because of path dependency and institutional lock-in.